yeah, let me let me kind of put this up real quick and so everybody can kind of see the pictures and what it looked like. Uh, so basically, our client was a how old, he was twenty six when the collision occurred. He was twenty six. He was actually I knew him in high school. We weren't friends in high school, but I like we knew of each other. And uh, I knew I was actually friends with his wife in high school, go figure, because they had met right after high school. But basically, uh, defendant is at lunch for the day with a couple of his co-workers. He works at Moon Mountain Farms, which is in Fulmore, for anybody who knows California. And uh, he gets a call and they say, listen, somebody, somebody passed out at the yard. You, you got to get here right away. So he doesn't even pay for his lunch. He, or he doesn't even eat his lunch. He pays for his lunch, hops in the car with everybody, and they're racing back to the yard. He gets on the 126 West, which is a 60 mile per hour uh, highway, and he misses the red light, and he plows into a car that's getting off the I-5 South off ramp. We really like to show that picture during the trial because it looked a hell of a lot worse than our client's car, which was essentially this one. We had a head-on collision. It's still a big hit. There's no question about that. Um, we just didn't have a lot of big injuries. There's our client, super endearing, uh, very sweet kid. But he had a two millimeter herniation. We used a lot of illustrations. This one was by Med Visuals to show that two millimeter MRI. Because if you look at the MRI down on the bottom left, there's not a lot of sex appeal to that thing. Um, doesn't really show any aggressive bulges or herniations. And so we really had to kind of play it up as best we could. He also had what's called a brachial plexus stretch injury. And the hard part of this case, one of the hard parts was that essentially when he was in the work comp system, because he was working at the time of the crash, the doctors just disagreed with each other. One of the, the orthopedists said it was a brachial plexus stretch injury. The uh, neurosurgeon would say, no, it's a disc issue. And a lot of the various MRIs that they would do came up clean, which became a little bit of a problem for us. And then, so we had to have a doctor kind of draw it out. I still don't understand this picture, but I think Eric did because he did the direct. Uh, he also had occipital neuralgia, which is basically the nerves that go up into the back of the head, which supported all of the headaches and everything that he was experiencing. And then we claimed a mild traumatic brain injury. And this was really hard because we had two clean MRIs. The DTI MRI, although we used it, we didn't use it that much because it had no focal deficits. It was basically his right hemisphere was a little messed up, but none of the um, pretty images that you normally get from a DTI played out for us. So we didn't even show it. We just kind of gave the findings of it. And so we didn't have a lot of objective findings for this other than the neuropsych testing. And we rode the neuropsych testing as far as we could, but the neuropsych testing was inconsistent with his employment records. So for example, the neuropsych testing said that he had, uh, that he had uh, deficits in multitasking, yet his reviews from work said that he was just such a great multitasker. And so what we tried to do is we tried to get rid of all of that by getting rid of the loss of earnings claim completely. And we didn't really have a good shot at that because he doubled his income, doubled the size of his house, had a kid after the wreck while he was recovering, uh, had another kid. And there was kind of a lot of inconsistencies that we're trying to deal with. And we got our motions in limine granted on those issues. So we had a motion in limine on, they couldn't talk about the wealth of the parties but in that, the judge kind of changed his mind in opening statement and said, well, his income is relevant to the brain injury, which I still don't get. And somehow his house size was relevant to something. And I, Eric, Nate, do you remember why? Did the judge ever give a reason why? No. Uh, I, one of the things we had a problem with is that the defense had belatedly stipulated to a few of our motions in limine. And I don't think that those registered with the judge as they were being violated. And by the time we talked to him about these violations, he was like, well, you know, I, you're claiming a lot of money and would just kind of leave it there every time. Yeah, when we first showed up at court, because Alex and Jason, two of the other partners at our firm, 
they had hit a $10.6 million verdict in his, in that judge's courtroom. And so when we went in, we tried to, you know, be friends with the judge. And we were like, yeah, like other attorneys in our firm were just in here. They were talking how great this courtroom was. And the judge goes, well, yeah, but they had a big case. And we were like, oh shit. <laughs> and he goes, this, this isn't a big case. And we were like, well, at least he didn't say that in front of the jury. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of how it started. The, the bad facts we had to deal with was he went back to work, depending upon who you asked, either four days after the collision or seven days after the collision. He worked full time all the way through, what, six years later to the time of trial. He got two, he changed jobs twice. He got promoted like three times. Um, and like, like we said, he had another kid after the crash. They were still, he was still having sex with his wife pretty regularly. Um, and uh, they got the bigger house and everything like that. So there were a couple, I think, facts that were inconsistent with, uh, with the theory of permanent injury. Yeah, and what we did really well in this case, which was kind of cool because I've never actually had the self-control to do it, is we kind of hid most of our good facts for most of, most of discovery and most of the trial. What we didn't tell anybody up until the defendant took the stand was that the defendant was on his cell phone. And we knew it because we got his cell phone records. But when I took his depot, he said he wasn't on the phone. And I was like, oh, okay, that's cool even though we had very clear records that showed, and we'll show them later on, he was on his cell phone. And he, he lied at his depot saying that he was going, <laughs> this didn't make any sense, we kind of hammered him for, he said he was going 30 miles per hour, so half the speed limit as he's going through the red light. So he only hit our client at 10 miles per hour. And Nate did a great job of this because he was like, <laughs> What was the thing you said about why don't you eat the lunch? <laughs> Cross, I said to him, I said, so you, you left your, you paid for your lunch, but you left your lunch. He's like, yeah. And, and you drove half the speed limit back to the yard. He's like, yep. I said, why didn't you stay and finish your lunch and then drive the speed limit? <laughs> the yard was far enough away. It was about a 40 minute <laughs> where if he was actually going half the speed limit, he turned a 40 minute drive into something that would take almost two hours. And I, I think that played, I could see one of the moments where you feel good in a trial is when one of your guys is on redirect or, or cross and you can hear the jury laughing at the other side. And I, I think Nate got him laughing against the other side uh, on multiple different occasions. Yeah. So yeah, when, when we kind of, I guess we should kind of just jump to mini opening cause that's where it all really started. Uh, Eric, if you kind of want to explain, because we wrote the mini opening twice and we went through a number of iterations and just, just so everybody kind of has context, the re one of the big reasons why we wanted to try this case, I mean, most people look at a two millimeter herniation, no surgery case. That was the other bad fact. He didn't have any surgery. Um, most people look at that and why the hell would you want to do that? The reason we wanted to do it was because usually when we work up the big cases, one of us gets edged out because either my dad, Rex Paris, or Bruce Schechter or both jump in. And so we never really get to try a case together. And so we figured if we took one with quite a few uh, warts on it, we'd actually get to try it. Yeah. And so I think that that was the beginning where we started talking about this mini opening in a new way, because if you have a Behar or, or one of those $50 million cases where it's, it's a matter of, of how big the case is. It, we used to do the minis very differently. And in this case, we were working on the mini opening together. Um, we started looking at it and I talked to, I think Alex Wheeler about it. And he had given me some articles about uh, a theory called the more losing the mini opening, um, where you give a very neutral aspect of how the crash occurred, a very broad definition of the injuries and, and how much money it might take to put them back together, but then very focused or very specific uh, reiterations of the defendant's arguments. So those things that Kale has just mentioned uh, that were bad for our case, like going back to work very quickly after the crash, doubling his income, doubling the size of his house and having another child after the crash, were all specifically put in the mini opening. Um, and so I, I don't wanna 
do the whole thing, but essentially you go through that this was a crash, that it happened at 60 miles per hour. Uh, you, you put the defendant to task for that. You say, look, you know, this was, this was a 60 mile per hour zone and he approached a, a controlled intersection. And for whatever reason, he didn't see the light. And so he goes through the light on the red at 60 miles per hour, he hits this other car. And for Matthew, there's nothing to do. Um, and then this is how you talk about those injuries in broad, in a broad respect. You say, look, you know, he, his neck went sideways in the crash and this caused the discs or the cushions in his spine uh, to tear and that it damaged the nerves that run out of his spine into his shoulder and into his right arm. And when his head snapped sideways, his brain also hit the inside of his skull, giving him what's called traumatic brain injury. Uh, and then you just kind of stop. These are the injuries to his spine and to his brain. That's what we're here to talk about. And his, his treating doctors, you know, they've seen him hundreds of times since the crash. Uh, and, and they're going to tell you they anticipate it costs more than $3 million to put him back together and to manage his injuries of the course uh, of, of his lifetime. And then you stop again. You say the defense team disagrees, right? They say that Matthew is not that hurt because doubled his income, doubled his his the side of his house, had another child, and he went back to work four days after the crash. And then you just kind of leave it there and you just say, look, you're going to hear a lot from both sides. And you're going to hear a lot of evidence from both sides about all these things. And we can't wait to show you the evidence we have for our case. And then you back it up one more day. You have to go through the non-economic damages and how those are worth at least as much as the medical bills I just told you about because this injury has changed Matthew's life, his wife's life, and, and the life they have with their children. And just bring it back over and over again. We can't, you know, we want to hear your thoughts and feelings about these injury selection. And again, we can't wait to tell you, you know, the whole story here. We're, we're limited right now. And then you tee it off. And I think what, what's nice about that strategy is they hear our number. They hear that it's a bad crash at 60 miles per hour, that He's unquestionably injured because he's been there, you know, 300 doctor visits already. But when you're giving ammo for cause to these jurors, they have very specific reasons to not like us. And they only have broad reasons um, to, to unfairly be on our side. And I think that's when that's how that was kind of how we sprung into to each panel uh, for jury selection. Yeah. And you'll notice, I mean, he didn't say anything about the cell phone barely said the red light. I mean, most of the focus is on what the defense is going to say, what the defense is going to say, what the defense is going to say. And you save the, the other stuff either for the, the time when it gets onto the examination of each witness uh, or an opening statement. And we went back and forth on whether or not we were going to bring the cell phone then or later. Um, and we'll talk about more of that. About One that. more thing that was fun, I think, in this case is the defense never really caught on to this strategy at all and thought, you know, we could see the, the adjuster and the attorney like high-fiving on breaks because like, wow, that didn't work for them. And then Richard, the defense attorney comes in right after my mini opening and he says, that, you know, yeah. And, you know, he was, he did go back to work right after and, and he did. And so he's doubling down and expanding and he's never, so by, by the time we get to the opening statement where we present, you know, things in more detail, he, I think they thought they were, they were yards and feet ahead of us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> there's one point, I think it was after day two of jury selection where the judge pulled us all out and he said, you know, I'm, I'm calling balls and strikes. I'm kicking jurors for cause, but all the other jurors are hearing what these jurors are saying about your case and basically that it sucks. You should consider settling. And I looked at the judge and I said, judge, I've got a monster of a case. It's stacked to the gills and I can't wait to show it to them. The number's a million bucks and it ain't changing. And they had offered us 370 and the judge goes, you should really reconsider your position. And when I, I just looked at him, I said, no, I'm not. And so we go back in and in front of me, he goes up to Nate and he goes, you know, Mr. Bruner, you can settle your case without him. You don't, you don't have to follow what he's doing <laughs> and, I just, and Nate just looks at him he was like yeah no <laughs> um so even even the judge thought that we had been pre that the whole panel had been preconditioned but I I felt good about it at that point I mean we 
we still had, it was day two and we still had a pretty halfway decent panel and we had a good cause challenge judge, Judge Harwin and Van Nuys, even though, and just for people who are outside of LA or uh, California, Van Nuys sucks. It just sucks. It is a terrible venue. It routinely doesn't put out a lot of money. And that was also another reason why I wanted Nate because Nate's used to that out in Nebraska. <laughs> it's not that bad, man. <laughs> uh, but I mean, it just has a lot of jurors that don't don't give money. And we almost dinged Judge Harwin just because of Van Eyes. And I'm happy we didn't. Um, he, so he that, was, that was uh, that you, you didn't use any of your dings. We didn't, didn't use ding? we didn't preemptory. I wanted to. And I think, Eric, did, you wanted to, too. Right. Yeah. And then we called my dad and we called Alex and Alex said, don't do it. And I got into a little bit of an argument with my dad which i usually do when we're talking about peremptories on judges and he just kept saying better the devil you know than the devil you don't and what we realized is what happens if we ding van nuys and not the judge and then we go back to van nuys just with a much worse judge because harwin's the best judge in van nuys and there's a lot of really bad judges in van nuys right and so we kept him and thank god we did because um, it would have been a hell of a lot worse. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, Harwin let us try our case. I, I think it was really nice to have Alex and Jason, who had just tried a case at, in front of him, you know, two months earlier, giving us some advice and some context um, into how he rules and, and why we should stick with him. Yeah. Um, we have a question whether or not the judge put any limits on Ward Iyer. <laughs> this is kind of funny for us because uh initially the judge said we couldn't mention a number in board i we couldn't mention a number in mini opening on what the non-economic damages could be which the law is totally against the judge on that but i i finally understand why because if you're going to follow the uh, why judges s still rule that way even though in california we have a case that's directly on point that Carpenter Zuckerman rally. Well, it's Carpenter Zuckerman now, but they argued and they got a great opinion that basically says, no, you can input a number in jury selection. But judges don't don't like it because if you're following the law, yeah, there's going to be a lot of jurors who will say I can't award one hundred million dollars when I don't even when they don't even have any evidence in front of them, because initially it's a crazy thought. <laughs> but and this judge did that anyways, and he wouldn't even let me argue it. I mean, they did an oral motion in limine on it and I'm trying to argue. And I was like, judge, I'd like to make a record. And he goes, no, we're not doing that. But what happened was Eric did a fantastic job of baiting him in the mini opening because our first mini opening, we didn't actually say a number. We said, we said millions of dollars in medical care. And millions more in, in pain and suffering. Yeah. And, in, and then millions and millions more. He said millions and millions. Mm -hmm. And so the defense attorney got scared. And in his mini opening, he threw out a number and he said, yeah, one, two, three million dollars. And so after his first mini opening, I got up and I said, judge, I want a mistrial. You got to strike this entire panel. You can't do a motion and limit to pro prohibit me putting out a number. And then this guy gets up and puts a low anchor on what we're going to be asking for. I'm not asking for one, two, three. I'm asking for 10, 20, 30. And the judge came back the next day and he said, I'm not happy about it, but you get to say a number. And it was, it was great it happened because I don't think we could have gotten the verdict we got without getting that out in front. Because it was a so, great tool to kick people. So just so I'm clear, you initially could not throw out and put a number out there, but then the defense lawyer just got up and said, what? One, two, three. The defense lawyer got up and said, they're gonna be asking for 1 million, 2 million, $3 million. In his mini opening. So he put out a number for us. And that's when I was able to say, judge, that's just not fair. You can't, you can't have a ruling that one side can say something, but the other side can't. And he, the judge agreed and the judge was pissed. The judge, was, oh. the judge was really pissed about it. So. What could the defense lawyer have been thinking by doing that? That's weird. He was, we, so we, we had read him because we went through all the expert depots with him and 
even Nate called it early on when he got there the first day. We had always kind of had this idea about him, but Nate was the first one to actually say it. He's a very reactionary individual. He was always fighting the fire right in front of him. And so if we could surprise him with things, whatever his immediate gut reaction was without really thinking he would go with. And so by putting it out in front of him that millions and millions of dollars, he hadn't thought of it before and he just felt like he had to defuse it. And so that's why it worked out that way. It was more us playing him and a little bit of luck than anything else. Um, I did think it was funny. So you, you give him these bad facts about your case, you stay broad. On, on what's good about your case and the injuries. And then you tell everyone, based on this description that we gave you, 10, 20, 30 million dollars, can you do that in jury selection? And then they'd be like, well, from what I heard, no, that doesn't seem like any evidence could support that. And then the judge would yell at the jurors and be like, you haven't heard any evidence yet. You still have to say you'd support. And just knowing that he went back to work four days later, you still have to be able to say, I would get, I, would, I could award. 10, 20, 30 million dollars based on those facts I heard, which I think created a pretty skewed, I, I think it set up a lot of four cause challenges for us because they're like, hey, wait a minute, if he went back to work four days later, how can you possibly say that this is a 20 million dollar case? And that's what we would hear from juror after jurors, like, well, he went back to work. No, no evidence that you could give me now would change my mind and make me think it's worth that much. And a lot of them fell for that reason alone. Yeah, so. We'll just kind of jump into that. So the, the way that we did, uh, the way we did jury selection is because we went on for five days. Oh, hold on, let me push that out. Oops. Because we went on for five days of jury selection, and I figured this out in our last trial that we did where we had a week and a half, the way that we would prep for jury selection, or I would prep is, I would listen to the mini openings each time because like Eric had to do four or five mini openings and they would always change a little bit. And the defense attorneys changed wildly. And so each day that each time there was a new mini opening, I'd sit there and I'd listen. Okay. What are the main bad facts that these jurors have just heard? Because when you have bad facts, the only time bad facts are good for you or the only phase in a trial in which bad facts are really good for you is in jury selection. Because that's what kind of feeds you reasons to kick jurors for cause. And so what we figured out is sometimes when the mini openings change, if you just write your bad facts out in the beginning of the trial, sometimes it won't be said either loud enough or clear enough or even at all for that panel to understand it. And so I find that just preparing by sitting there and just listening, and I had a pen and a paper and I literally wrote these out each day as it would come along. And these are the main bad facts that we had that we could use during jury selection to kind of feed it through to kick them for cause. And the way that I always approach it is that we, we had a questionnaire, which I think you should try to get a questionnaire every time. And Dan, if you'll remind me, I'll send out our questionnaire on this one. And we, we had a bitching questionnaire this time. I mean, it was, it had literally everything that you could ever want. And I thought it did a real good job of segmenting who were the big money givers and who were the nots. And so we used the questionnaires to kind of put them in two separate bags. I either had somebody who could give money or somebody who couldn't. And the first initial discussion with them when I finally got to talk to them was kind of geared around me trying to slowly figure out in a soft way, can you give money or not? Are my suspicions that we've developed through your questionnaire true? Because it's not always true. I mean, there's an exception to every rule and everything. And so I'd always want to verify it. And if I figured that you were one of those jurors that could not give money, I'd just start soft pedaling through these bad facts to start reinforcing them that, yeah, they hate me. Yeah, they hate this case. And yeah, my client is a faker, a liar, and a cheat. And we were always trying to polarize the case through jury selection, through mini opening, through closing, through everything, even the witnesses. Either he's a liar, a cheat, and a fake, or he's real. And it's either 10, 20, 30 million dollars or fuck it, give them nothing. Yeah, which is funny because the defense attorney was typically not going that far. 
and spent at least 20% of his time confusingly saying, no, you know, we don't think he's a liar or a cheat. We just think maybe it's smaller than what they're saying. But then he'd get baited into what Kale's saying and say, you know, uh, he could have been a liar and a cheat. And so I think it was very confusing for the other side to have, have us being more aggressive on both sides. If, if you don't find that he's telling the truth, give him nothing. Yeah, he called us fraudsters at one point. And I use that. That was the gift from heaven. I mean, I, I, it just, everything was, are we fraudsters? Are we fakes? Um, but anyway, so then once you get through, uh, once you kind of have your bad facts laid out, you also got to have your kicking jurors for cause metaphors and have multiple of them. And this is something you can do before the trial. And everybody's always heard the, if we're at a starting line, are we further back? or the, uh, do you have a strong conviction or things like that? These were the main ones that I wrote out. I, I figured out the, I actually learned the can I earn your trust from Nate. And I think Nate learned it in the middle of the trial <laughs> or he made it up in the middle of the trial or in the middle of jury selection, I'm not really sure. Um, but I mean, for those, I, I think everybody knows the starting line of a race, but I'll do it anyways. Starting line of a race is if this were a foot race and there's a line, the starting line, we're, we're at the start of this trial. And so are both parties, both the defense and the plaintiffs, are they sitting at that same starting line or are we a little bit further back? And there's, and then you use that to kind of establish that, you know, the jury can't be fair. But when you're doing these, it, I mean, anybody who's ever had a long jury selection knows if you just use that one, the jurors are like, I don't give a shit about your damn line. Like, they just get tired of hearing it over and over and over and over again. And so you got to do variations on it. And that was something I actually learned from Nate because we, we're going through it. And after the first day, Nate gets up and he goes, now you heard Mr. Paris talking about that start line. It is my client, Lisa Horner, is she in this race, does she got two busted hamstrings and a broken ankle just for you? And all the jurors kind of laughed about it. And we just had variations that we could go off. And as we would go through the days, I don't know why this happened, but seemingly the injuries that our client would have on that starting line would just slowly get worse and worse. Uh, and I think it culminated on the fifth day where I got up and I said, now, sure, whoever, um, you've heard me talk about this line. Is it fair to say that in your mind, not only is my client a little bit further back, he's also running with only one leg. And jurors would kind of laugh and just say yes about it. Um, but you, you have to you do a lot of variations because when you get into these marathon jury selections, it, it gets brutal if you just ask everybody the starting line of a race. The next one is the beliefs versus jury instructions. And this is my favorite um, by far uh, because it just, it gets so many people for cause. We learned this in our last trial, the $49 million one that my dad's going to talk about at the Paris Trial College. Um, but essentially what it is, is you build up somebody's beliefs as they're going through and you're talking about, and you try to find what's their strongest belief against your case. And usually it's money. Usually it's tens of millions of dollars. And you just kind of talk about like billboards and sometimes you see verdicts and they're too high maybe even throw in a McDonald's hot coffee if you want, use that to your favor and just building up, they have a belief either against lawsuits or against large verdicts. You can also do it for uh, against loss of consortium, which is good. And once you build up their belief that it's a strongly held belief, that it's a part of their belief systems, they've had it for a long time. And it's something that really, if you get down to it, is part of the things that just make up who they are. You then compare that with, now, Miss Godwin, if I were to ask you, if when you get back into that deliberations room at the end of the trial, and you're faced with a scenario in which you have to decide, am I gonna go with my strongly held beliefs against large verdicts, against lawsuits, or the judge's instructions? And those two things conflict. Which one are you gonna go with?